This is the Woke Daisy. Hello, TW Dears, and welcome back to a brand new episode of The Woke Daisy. I'm Nehal. And I'm Annika. And something Nehal and I have been discussing lately is Pride Month, which is normally in June. With the current area of need in social justice being the Black Lives Movement, Pride Month is a lot quieter this time around. And I read a tweet about how allyship was demonstrated beautifully through the LGBTQIA community, because instead of saying, wait, this is our month, or LGBTQIA lives matter too, They shared the stage and they just showed a lot of grace and camaraderie with another marginalized group. Once again, intersectionality matters, and so does fighting the fight for other groups. Another point is that while awareness months are amazing to draw attention to a particular movement or a population that really deserves that moment in the light, change takes a consistent application of work and effort. We know it's July, but the work needs to be done across the board all year round. So we're bringing the conversation back to something that we think is really important mental health, and sexuality. Your sexuality plays a super important role in your overall identity and sense of self. When we say the word sexuality, we're actually talking about a person's sexual orientation or preference, who you are emotionally, mentally, and physically attracted to, and most recently brought up on our Instagram, this can also mean being asexual. Sexuality can refer to a person's capacity for sexual feeling or desire to engage in sexual activity and with whom. So what is the correlation between sexuality and mental health? For some, coming out leads to acceptance and support, and for others, particularly those in the South Asian community, it can lead to stigma, discrimination, violence, and exclusion. As we discussed on the episode LGBT Curious About Health, access to resources for the community are really, really flawed, particularly with healthcare. And common feelings that can affect your emotional health and well-being include feeling different from other people around you, feeling pressure to deny or change your sexuality, as well as verbal or physical bullying around sexuality. I mean, how many times have we all heard our friends say the dreaded F word when it comes down to describing somebody who's gay or being like, that's so gay. I've made an effort to correct people on that, but I know that it takes a lot more from every single person that hears it to be able to actually make real change. And that's what we're here to talk about today with the help of the South Asian Sexual and Mental Health Alliance, or SASMA. Before we introduce the fabulous people of SASMA, I want to break down some stats I found while researching this episode. According to the Mental Health National Org, in 2020, so this year, 4.5% of the U.S. population identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. That's 4.5 million people in our country alone. And of those, 39% have reported having a mental illness in the past year. That's more than the entire population of Kentucky. For those of you listening who are not from the U.S., pull out a map because Kentucky is massive. The reason that this stat is so important is because of that number. 39% versus the average for all adults, 18.9%. That's more than double. Being LGBTQ adds mental health burden, and it's not even just being LGBTQ+, plus, but it's society stressors that contribute. And how have the attitudes been? 57% of LGBTQIA people say that they or an ally have been threatened or non-sexually harassed. 51% say they have been sexually harassed. And 51% say they've experienced violence because of their identity or sexuality. More than half of these LGBTQIA members feel like they've had fewer employment opportunities, and 22% have avoided doctors out of concern that they would be discriminated against. Which kind of brings us back to our conversation with Dr. Naveen Dargani around how minorities like the LGBTQIA community face issues in the health industry when it comes to access, medical personnel lacking training, and so many more issues. These are obstacles that keep people from actually getting the help that they desperately need. The average queer teen is six times more likely to experience symptoms than a non-LGBTQ plus identifying teen. And an LGBTQ youth is more than four times as likely to attempt suicide compared to a heterosexual youth. And I'm bringing up these stats because they are so important. Last year, 48% of transgender adults reported they considered suicide compared to 4% of the entire U.S. population. This is why this conversation is so important in mental health care, stigma, lack of cultural sensitivity, an unconscious and conscious reluctance to address sexuality and how it all hampers the effectiveness of care. 
Through the help of our special guest today, we'll unpack what we can do better to support the LGBTQIA community in terms of mental health, learning about their personal narratives, and why this topic is so special. Hello, Sri and Tanya. Thank you so much for being on with us today. Tell me a little bit about yourselves and how SASMA came to be, but most importantly, what pronouns should we use today? Sure, yeah. Thanks for asking my pronouns as well. Um, I'm Sri. Nice to meet you both. And I use she pronouns. Um, yeah, I can share a little bit, I guess, about myself personally and how SESMA came to be, and Tanya can take it from there. Um, in terms of the background of what came about, I mean, I've always been somebody who has known that I want to go into mental health. And for me, actually, when I got into undergrad, so I started studying psych, uh, but then when I was in undergrad at the University of Maryland, I also started Sex Week at Maryland. And so really was get diving into looking at how our sexuality and our sexual health also plays into our mental health. Um, and then currently, I am now pursuing my PhD in counseling psychology uh, and continuing on the focus specifically on multicultural counseling, um, sexuality, romantic relationships, and specifically queer people of color. So all of those things kind of really neatly dive into what we do as SESMA, um, specifically, obviously, with that South Asian American lens in terms of our identity. So I'll throw to Tanya in terms of what, uh, you know, how this beautiful partnership, and we're just two of the four, four, four co-founders, oh gosh, um, but how that partnership came to be. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. So I'm Tanya or Tanya, depending on what pronunciation you feel like using. Um, so I'm based out of the D.C. area. And um, so I have a master's in reproductive biology. And, you know, initially it didn't start that way. It was like med school, Ph.D., all that stuff. And then everything took kind of a left turn. Um, but I ended up exactly where I was supposed to be. So I work in HIV in the field of sexual health and, you know, all the things that intersect with HIV. And I absolutely love it. Um, so SASMA, what it is now became like the bridge between my professional life and my personal life, because like five years ago, my mom couldn't tell people what I did. She was like, Tanya works in public health, you know, <laughs> and it couldn't say what it was. And now she's like, Tanya works in sexual health. And I'm, I'm so proud of my mom for being able to say that. Um, but SASMA, you know, it, it became actually it started with like a conversation between me and my brother, who is one of our co-founders, Trinish Chatterjee about a friend who was going through mental health issues and she's Bangladeshi and just like the barriers that we all know about in the South Asian community were coming up with her parents and her family. Um, and we were just kind of like literally in the kitchen just being like, there's nowhere to really talk about this stuff. No one that understands, you know, us straddling two cultures, what we're going through. And then it was like, OK, let's start something. <laughs> So then I messaged uh, Sri, I messaged Shriya, who's our fourth co-founder, because we all had like a collective interest in these topics. Um, and then we, you know, kept talking, kept talking, did our first workshop in 2016. And then it's just kind of taken off from there. So that's how we were born. <laughs> When it comes to sexual health, you mentioned that it's not talked about. And even on our podcast, we try to have these conversations and people are like, wow, I can't believe you guys are talking about it. How did your parents or family members take this initiative by you guys? Like, okay, we're going to talk about sexual health very openly. Um, I, th I think I know for me specifically, especially because, you know, same thing with my work, right? I was trying to find the words to be able to be more comfortable and like, you know, bring back like what happened at work today in terms of sexual health or whatever. Um, I know when we did our first workshop, I, you know, I hadn't told my mom exactly what it was about. I was like, it's about stuff, you know, like mental health. And she was like, can I come watch? And I was like, no, oh my God, you cannot be there. Like, I was so scared that like, honestly, that like, you know, it would be like, oh, my God, like, why are you talking about this stuff? Like, I know you work there, but like, don't bring it into the community. But they have really opened up and like, it's been better and better. There's still some stuff, you know, we obviously spar about. But like, we can have conversations now that are not that that are uncomfortable, that are not just like, oh, we can't even talk about it, you know. So it's it's opened up. That resonates with me a lot because I had the same thing, you know, with my undergrad degree. It was very heavily reproductive health focused and that was intentional and my parents were kind of like okay that's fine what are you taking this semester and I'd be like you know four sex sexual health classes a biology class and you know that random psych class that I have to take because it's required and 
my parents were kind of like, okay, whatever interests you. And my mom was like, do you want to be like Dr. Ruth? Now, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Ruth was like a sexual advisor on the radio or something like this, you know, back in like the 90s. I don't know if she's still she's still doing it. But yeah, dude, she was around a long time. Yeah. So that's what our parents knew of. And so my mom was terrified that I was going to go onto the radio and start giving out sexual advice, which is kind of funny now because I run a podcast that gives out sexual advice. So, you know, Maybe she wasn't wrong, but it is so funny because those conversations did, just like you said, Tanya, started opening up because it would be like, okay, I'm just going to bring home my schoolwork and tell you what I'm learning today. And it would start, you know, kind of going from my mom, which is something that I've told the podcast listeners before. My mom used to spell out the word sex until I was probably 26 years old. And so she used to be like sex and i was like we all know what it is let's talk about it and it was a little bit bold but at the same time it got to this point where now she will say oh yeah you know did you hear about this thing during childbirth about episiotomies did you hear about this did you hear about that and she's so open with it and that never would have happened had we not actually normalized the conversation and brought home work and brought home school and brought them home, and then just made it a part of our daily routine. So if any of our listeners are wondering, it is actually kind of groundbreaking, and it also does push those boundaries in a really healthy way if you do bring it home and start talking about it like it's totally normal. And whenever everyone's like, what are you doing? If you're just like, oh, it's just work, you know, just totally calm and totally relaxed about it, and you're not like freaking out, then, you know, eventually they they come around too. So that point really resonated that you are so comfortable doing it. And that, of course, there are still moments where, you know, you're not going to like bust out conversations about vibrators with your mom, but, you know, you sure are going to be able to. <laughs> Maybe in 10 years. <laughs> yes, very good. <laughs> Yes, maybe the that's impossible hey, hey. has been made possible before. <laughs> Truth, maybe that's just inspiration for us now <laughs> to go forward. But you know, I think you know you're, you're so right about normalizing that conversation. It's really incredible that you guys all found each other and decided to push this initiative out there. So, what does your organization sort of want to discuss, and how do you guys create these conversations? And I guess, what are your macro goals and what are your micro goals? Before I answer that, I will quickly throw out there that I looked up really quick. Dr. Ruth is still alive. She's 92 years old. So <laughs> that's wow. if if we're not talking about what openly talking about sexuality and sexual health does for your mental and physical health. Like if that does not underscore the point. <laughs> that's, 92, baby. That's what we're 92. going for. Um, so speaking to our goals, yeah, so what we really aim to do, um, I mean, so SESMA itself stands for the South Asian Sexual and Mental Health Alliance. And so that is core to who we are and what we are. And our entire mission is to really talk about all of those things that tend to be taboo for brown kids. Um, and so we typically define that as sexual health, mental health, LGBTQ issues, and then also just kind of overall identity, like what that hybrid, you know, dual identity looks like. And so that can really be all sorts of different things, whatever is relevant to any South Asian American kid or any other child of the diaspora. Um, And so that's been our inspiration in terms of even our own podcast. And we called it the Brown Taboo Project for exactly that reason of like, let's talk about all the things that are kind of chi-chi, right? Like that are the aunties and uncles are like, or that you were nervous about I think we've all had that freaking moment of being at a dinner party where some auntie or uncle is like, oh, you know, you look so well. How are you doing in school? And then you're in your head. You're like, you don't freaking know what I did last night, kid. Like, the, And I think it's that moment of and it kind of exactly what you were speaking, Danica, of like really being able to bring our whole selves and figure out how we can bring those sides and, and acknowledge that. There are differences in terms of our cultures of origin, as well as, you know, the the host culture, wherever we are, and that we've created some beautiful, unique, you know, third culture thing. Um, so in terms of, I think, I don't know, our goals, like for all of us, literally, this is the second or third thing that we do. Uh, it's probably not that different for y'all. And so I think in that sense, we've really grown pretty slowly and organically. Um And we always we come to this question of goals all the time. And I think, you know, in terms of at least the macro side, one day we hope that we could kind of be a standalone organization. Um, 
And that's something that at least Tanya and I have talked about of like dreaming of like if we can, because I think we really do. I mean, both of us mend both of those areas, but my explicit training is more so in mental health and Tanya's explicit training is more so in sexual health. So I think the two of us and really like taking that background and expertise and like, what if we could have a brick and mortar one day or like what would it look like to go around and um, share workshops and seminars as our full-time jobs of like engaging South Asian and other immigrant folks. Like group therapy sessions. Group therapy sessions would be so cool to attend, especially on these topics that you can't talk about at home because maybe you're not comfortable meeting like-minded people. I mean, just by looking at your Instagram, there is such a good network opportunity with your podcast that you do, with other workshops that you guys host. There is so much opportunity to meet people and kind of open up when you're not comfortable in your own skin or not comfortable at home. So I love that. You know, having built a website, you know, and it was fairly recent for us, like in the last, I think, like two years is when our webs two years two three years that our website came about and then instagram was like even newer than that and like and you know kind of realizing the power of a digital platform and how much more you can do with it and like right now we're exploring virtual workshops because obviously our plans for this year went to shit um so you know just trying to figure out and and kind of pivot a little bit but also like you know use that um resource that we have at hand which is like the virtual world So we've talked a lot about how sexual health and mental health are go hand in hand with your organization, also the events that you do and the things that you talk about. But going back to the basics, how exactly are they correlated and why is it so important to see that they go hand in hand in the first place? I think one of the, you know... So I don't even know like exactly where to start with this because there's so much to talk about, you know, like, um, but I think... You know, growing up as a kid, right, and and being told that like sex is sh- like things we hear, right? Shame, shame. Like you don't talk about it, don't even think about it, right? Like all of this negativity around this very normal, very beautiful thing that happens between two humans or more humans or you yourself, you know, however you choose to do it, right? It's all good and great and wonderful. Um, and then like. As you grow up and you become your own person, you come into your own sexuality, you realize like, wait a minute, like, why is this dirty? Why is this shameful? Right. And like the and the, and the, I think the thing with sex that like I've come to realize is and sex ties in so many things. Right. There's m- mental health. Obviously, there's questions about the patriarchy. There's questions about expectations like it actually like affects every other part of your life. Right. The way that you know, especially in South Asian cultures, like uh, women are treated or girls are treated and and how they're expected to live and act and your virginity is so important. And it's like the thing you have to take to your marriage, right? Otherwise, like you're not worth it. No one's going to marry you. Like all of those things become can become a burden when when they clash with who you're trying to be. Right. And so like, you know, living your life like to the fullest is also living your sexual life to the fullest whatever that means to you and like especially being part of the lgbtq community and like the expectation of being heterosexual is ever present not only in our community but everywhere else too right and like just how do you you know how can you be healthy if you if you can't live your full life is how i look at it And I think a lot of the times people don't realize, like they only focus on like the heterosexual sex portion of things. And so after having that conversation with you, Tanya, when we got on the phone, I realized that there was so much more to it. And it's not even just about sex pleasure with yourself, but discovering your identity, discovering your sexuality and going beyond that. And so I think that's really interesting to think about, along with everything you said in the patriarchy. And just we talked about this in an episode we did called Let's Get Clitorate about how women are seen as this like divine, pure thing. And like once you go past that, like you can't and you're seen as this dirty person. And that's just crazy to me because they also want you to be like this woman kind of divine person. How are you supposed to be everything for someone when you can't even accept who you are? 
And it really represses sort of the carnal side, just the instinct that you have as a human being if you are someone who is into sex and that causes you to hold back. And if you aren't, then even that scene is a weird thing. And so a lot of the people in the asexual community are often judged because they seemingly don't have the instinct that everybody else has. So they're judged on that. And then if you do have the instinct, you're judged on that too. And then on top of that, you know, we've done an episode on pelvic pain and one of we've done a couple episodes actually and one of the doctors mentioned that a lot of the patients who have come in for consultations are people who become so tense that they can't actually have sex penetrative sex because in their minds they've had such a value placed on not only their virginity but the entire act of sex itself that it does psychologically impact them which then physiologically impacts them so that's just with the act of sex but if you really look beyond that to all of your physical health as a whole there's a lot of different effects that the stress from having to measure up to all of these different things and all of the mental health side of it and then also your sexual health side of it can really impact and your whole body can kind of go completely haywire in response to all of this stress. I mean, if I'm being really frank, I started, you know, just exploring my body in the last three to four years just to see, you know, what was there and stuff. And just kind of releasing all that energy was so amazing to me. Like having the first orgasm or even talking about it with someone being like, okay, I flicked the bean. It was awesome. <laughs> it was like such a different experience on my mental health. Like talking about it with my girlfriends was not something I would have done maybe like four to five years ago because it was weird. Like you do not talk about what you do in your alone time. But being able to talk about it on this podcast, even with Annika, we have talked about our own fair share of things. You can be open about it, and I think that's where the conversation should begin. But what are some health benefits to um, sex and mental health? Like, what are some things that are good about it? There's a huge, huge piece in terms of exactly what you're kind of speaking to. Once you can relax into your body a little bit more, and that piece of – I mean, if you think about any of the ways that we experience any kind of – mental health distress and we talk about you know kind of the mind body connection for per, for every single mental health disorder there's some amount of physical side that does go along with that and whether that's something you can touch or see or not is kind of you know what makes it be considered like a mental health disorder in some way right so it's like okay i can't necessarily see where my, you know, I don't have enough of this like neurotransmitter, right? That's kind of the classic way you thought you talk about it. But also in the sense that classic symptoms of depression are your appetite changing, not being able to sleep as well, sleeping too much, right? Or if you think about anxiety that that manifests in the body, you see that in terms of jitteriness, you see that in terms of a clenching jaw or pain in your stomach. Um, one of the fun facts I love to share is that so you know, we talk about how we have our neurons in our brain and you're kind of you're like, okay, those are the cells in the brain, right? We actually have more neurons in our stomach than we do in our brain. And I love sharing that fact with folks in terms of they're like that thing of even when you talk about like butterflies, right? Or what is that sensation or any of these things? You're like, no, it's we can't arbitrarily divorce our mental health from our physical health as if our brain is not also a part of our body. (laughs) And so that piece of like that absolutely goes both ways in terms of when you are able to be more comfortable and um, explorative and just like confident in some ways in terms of your physical self, that that really does impact your self-esteem, your mood, your ability to feel confident, to just feel in touch with yourself. And if you're thinking about that in terms of, you know, trauma as well, right? And those impacts in terms of trusting, if you can't even like trust your voice, why would you trust your body? Um, And what you're speaking to in terms of um, any kind of genital or pelvic pain and how there's absolutely, I mean, that's in the DSM. Like it's a psychological issue often way so way more than it is in the typical realm of physical health issue. And yet, and then as we talk about society and gender and kind of the cultural expectations that come in there of for people with penises who have erectile dysfunction or who are experiencing issues with their sexuality, the solution tends to be, oh, just pop this pill to increase your blood flow. And yet there isn't necessarily that for people with vulvas. And in terms of like, there tends to be a little bit more of, it's the same thing happening. There's something mental that's happening. It's not necessarily that there's like a physical aberration if you could do this before and you can't in that moment. So I think, I mean, there's like, 
scores of examples of where – and I think it's kind of one of those like more – I don't know. It can sound like hippie and new agey to be like the mind body connection. But I really do think it is critical to the ways in which we understand ourselves and sit with ourselves and just recognizing that sexual health, mental health, physical health, our general reproductive health, emotional health, spiritual health, like all of those things, they're, they all play into our wellness. They all play into our well being and they are very interconnected. They are not something that you can just say, I'm really flourishing in this area um, and I'm crap in that area and that there's not going to be some amount of interplay. And I think one of the things, you know, at its core, right, like sex is pleasure, right? Like that, that is inherently what it is, but it's, it's this like heteronormative expectation that sex is only for reproduction. And I think that's where a lot of issues come from too, because people lose the pleasure around sex and they and because they're told it's like a dirty thing it's not something you need to you should enjoy it's not something you should do unless it has that function of producing a child which again you know perpetrates heteronormative nor- normativity and the fact that like sex is only penis my and sex doesn't sex. count like, apparently no, like, like, right thanks, exactly cool, right great, like I'll all that kind it. of stuff right <laughs> yeah exactly right like and and i think that's such a huge part of what how it can affect your mental health and and you know, that inherent benefit of like stress relief and pleasure and just human connection at the end of the day, right? Whether you're having sex with someone you you met 10 minutes ago or whether it's your, you know, 80-year-old partner or whatever that you've been with for 60 years, like it's human connection at the end of the day. Like it does not have to have an outcome. Yeah, it does not have to, it's not, it doesn't have to be transactional, right? That like it has to create a child or it has to do something for your marriage. But unfortunately, like that's especially in South Asian society, like that's what we're ingrained to believe. And that has a very negative effect on your mental health, for sure. I know you mentioned, you know, heteronormativity, but just like going along with that, there's also a minority majority kind of disparity, too, between the mind body connection and just how you fit in with yourself and how you see yourself in relation to the world. Because once again, sex is an act that forms those connections or that builds those connections regardless of what gender what sex and what how you see the world it's how you connect with it and so what is the minority stress theory for lgbtq people but also other identities as well and how does this all fit into the concept of your role in the world and your connection with people yeah so minority stress was originally formed by a scholar of the last name Meyer. Um, and it really was initially formed thinking specifically about the experiences of queer people. Um, and that has been expanded from there to talk about all the different impacts that minority being a minority, like whatever marginalized identity that might be, has on your mental health. Um, and so, I mean, there's two sides of it. So I'll start in terms of the stress aspect of it, of for any of and even as y'all saw in the intro right of like for any of the identities that people hold it's not that having that identity or status is inherently what makes you have more mental health distress or more physical impairment or um, less educational aptitude right like we know all of that is just bullshit it's not the identity itself that makes people inherently different from one another. It's the pressures of society and it's the ways in which the culture does or does not accept certain identities or experiences, you know, and promotes, endorses certain things over the other. So with that in mind, thinking about how for queer people, for LGBTQ people, there's this piece of it's not that you are necessarily inherently, you know, dirty or shameful or whatever that might be for the type of sex or lack of sex that you engage in, but it is the ways in which it is viewed and then therefore how you have to kind of like build up a thicker skin because you're anticipating being discriminated against or harassed in some way. And so, and then you just think about how that then compounds not only with queerness, but with all of the other marginalized identities that can happen along with that and thinking really in in the ways in which our intersectional unique identities create this whole new thing of like, what does it mean for me as a South Asian woman who is also queer, right? And none of those things can really be separated from one another for me or any other human for the for that matter. If you are 
a straight white man, that's also an intersection of identities that's important to talk about and think through. And then you add into that disability. You add into that having being gender nonconforming in some way. You add, you know, like any of these additional things, um, the pressures of not having economic privilege, of not having as much opportunity. And so you can really start to see how how quickly things can pile up and having those additional stressors make it that much harder to live, you know, your full actualized life. And if we know that these things are hard enough to talk about in our society, in our culture, even for the straight white cis dudes, then like just imagine as you're, you know, that's still like kind of uncouth to talk about sex, then like really think about as you dig down further and further what that looks like. Um, And I do want to flip it on its head real quick because I think saying that also kind of makes it this really like bleak outcome of like, oh, no, the more marginalized and oppressed you are, like you're never going to dig out. The flip side of this is also the amount of resilience and strength that happens with that and the ability to just be like, fuck it. Like this is all out the window and I get to be able to radically reimagine what really is fitting for myself and my own life and my own relationships and my own community and to really have power in that and like the beauty of of deciding for yourself coming to a place where you're able to just um operate from that place of like okay it's outside of the quote unquote norm but there's so much strength in being able to abandon that norm or being able to figure out which parts fit for you um and which parts don't so it's not a horrible report card necessarily, but I do think there is, at least in the society that we are born into and that we live in and present, there's definitely like a journey that has to happen, this piece of identity development. And that's, I think, also true for us as South Asian Americans. Like, I think for all of us, there's this thing that we can relate to of like what that navigation had to be. And it's idiosyncratic for every person. Um, And I think that's true for like any layer of marginalized or oppressed identity status that you hold. So how does SASNA help these marginalized populations, actually? I would love to know what your organization does to kind of help people break out of that shell or keep that conversation going and stuff. Um, I think one of one of kind of like, I guess, like the cornerstone presentations that we've workshops, presentation, whatever you want to call it, um, that we put together um, last year is um, basically it's it's um, what will people say is what it's titled. So we've said it in Bengali. So Lok Ki Bolbe. We've said it in Hindi. Lok Kya Kahenge. Right. Um, but basically, like every South Asian person, no matter how privileged or underprivileged, doesn't matter, has heard this expect this like thing that that's in our community of like what old people say right like you know think about your decision 28 times before you do it you're shaming your family you're shaming your community you're shaming your must who lives in california like you're shaming the entire world and their dog and whatever because you chose to wear, wear a crop top today right and like like the weight that puts on people right and 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 these crazy expectations like think about like telling like a nine-year-old kid that you can't wear such and such because it makes you look sexual or something like that right and it's very insidious right because there's not only like you know patriarchal or heteronormative expectations there's academic expectations you know to be a doctor to be an engineer to be this and that and like it perpetrates every part of your life down to your your sexual identity, who you're having sex with, who you're having relationships with, right? And then you think about like the realm of relationships and expectations around, oh, don't marry someone who's Muslim if you're Hindu because that's bad. Don't marry someone who's black because we hate black people, right? Like truly, that's actually what our society does. Um, don't marry someone of a lower caste because you're bringing yourself down, quote unquote, because we have to maintain our status, right? Like. It's insane to navigate all of that, like anywhere in the world, whether you live in India, whether you live here, whether you're straddling multiple cultures like we are. Right. And like I think like that workshop has been really great to get these conversations going and to help people realize that like at the end of the day, these, you know, we talk about, you know, conniving aunties, you know, talking behind your back and, you know, gossiping about you. They're like, ultimately, they don't have power over you. And just like Sri said, like, it's reimagining your reality to what you want it to be and like going really deep into your identity and kind of 
pulling out like, you know what, this is my life. This is really important to me. And who cares what people are saying? Like, you know, who cares if, you know, and, and yes, there are negative consequences to living your life freely, right? We all know that, but sometimes they're worth it, you know, to, to, to be free and, and to live your life as you are. Um, so I think like that's been one of the cornerstone conversations that we've had that, that I know has made an impact, you know, not only our audience, but even myself, you know, the first time we did the workshop, cause I was in the audience watching, um, and it made me like tear up a little bit. <laughs> Oh, so cute. Glad to hear that. <laughs> but no, I do think, I mean, in terms of what, and I feel like y'all do the same thing. And, and that's why it's so awesome to be able to bring our communities together, right? And like join forces in this way, because it's really, I think, just this matter of trying to bring up these conversations and actually be explicit about the things that we weren't allowed to be explicit about. And so we absolutely do that with in-person workshops and seminars, which are also now in the time of COVID virtual. Side note, please hire us. We will totally come do your gig. Um, so we do that. But then we also, you know, for those reasons of wanting to expand it, not just to the folks who happen to be able to be present for whatever workshop or seminar or conference or community org it is that we're working with, but also to be able to do that with a podcast for folks. And we've had folks, you know, like, from Pakistan, from the UK, from we've had listeners from South Africa who are like, this is awesome to hear somebody talking about it. And I sent it to my cousin or I thought of my friend who, you know, like whatever the whatever the touchstone might be for you personally, but just being able to know that like, oh, I'm not the only one who was having this experience or having this thought that like, even if you don't physically have that community or haven't had that conversation in person with someone to still know that it's out there. Um, and that's, you know, across website, like social media, podcast, in-person stuff. And this beauty of us as South Asians in terms of the U.S., we're actually a pretty small population, all told. And so it makes sense, you know, like not just overall the Asian numbers are small, but even even more specifically within that. South Asians are small. And so being able to link up across, even though there's so much diversity within the South Asian experience, there's also a lot of common threads. And so really just being able to be like, let's talk about these things. And especially as we are, you know, second gen, 1.5 gen folks who at this point are coming to the age of starting to have marriages and have babies and decide for themselves what kind of community and family they want to create. And so that piece of like, okay, what is this going to look like? You know, what are the messages and pieces of our culture that we do want to pass on? And what are the pieces that we're like, mm, not today, auntie. It's not working for me. Yeah, I'll keep the shardy, but I'm going to take the shame out. <laughs> like, <laughs> whatever that looks like. Another important topic I think that we kind of touched on that I really wanted to get your opinion on was being sexually repressed in the South Asian community. We're supposed to be this like land of the Kama Sutra and stuff. And why are we told to not wear crop tops or, you know, don't be sexual, but then we're also over-sexualized. You're exotic. You're so gorgeous. Oh my God. Like how, what, what's going on with that? Um, I think colonialism plays a big part, right? I think that's well. I <laughs> think goes, oh, we can just can you we know, write a check that's the to answer for a lot of the problems that the world has, and it is certainly for for this one. It's um, so because true. I mean, you know, the Kama Sutra, and I think like especially in the West, right? People are like, "Oh my God, it's like all about sex," and like I'm not a scholar on it, but I have read that it. Is it? It's a, It's the text is um, a text on how to live your life like to the full extent, and sex is a part of it. And here's like how to do it really well. So here's some tips and ideas for it's you. It's literally ten percent of the entire thing. Yeah. I did a full episode with Anika on this, and we were just breaking it down and letting people know, like you know, it's ten percent sex. It's about how to be a better person, a better this. Also, there's a lot of like misogyny and other things that we're not going to get into, but there are parts of it that I don't agree with and it's very outdated. But yeah, it's definitely not about sex and it's been over-sexualized in our Cosmopolitan magazine. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But then like you have that, right? And like 
in its like um, most simpler terms, like, you know, that means that the, what the text says is like, here's how to live a good life. And, you know, here's how to have good sex while you're at it, because sex is important. Right. And then. Right. <laughs> Better be good. Right. Like and then like, you know, every, you know, everything has happened and, you know, we were colonized. South Asian countries, along with many other countries around the world, were decimated and looted and stripped of all their resources. Anyway, we're not going to get into that because that's a whole other <laughs> podcast topic. Um, but what I think what ended up happening is with this what with the Western influence came these like very like Christian ideas of, you know, again, heteronormativity and patriarchy. And, you know, I know like, you know, a classic example is, you know, not historically accurate exactly, um, but like back in the day, day, like people, you know, women didn't wear blouses and stuff, you know, and saris were draped in a more sensual way, right? And then like the blouses and petticoats and, and the way that saris are actually draped now is like something that came with the British when they were like, oh my God, these people look like that. Like we got, we got to fix them up, you know? And like, you know, and, and people started becoming more covered and, you know, kind of hiding everything. Right. And that's like where we are today. And then also in South Asian society, you're constantly living this thing of like, you're expected to be sexual, I guess, like to your husband when you get married so you can have children, right? But you can't be sexual in any other aspect of your life ever because it's like shame, shame, no, no, can't do that, you know? So like, how are you supposed to live? <laughs> this also goes with how males were raised and I don't really want to get into this, but it's the whole thing that Annika and I always freaking mention is they are raised in a way in a lot of times in the South Asian community where they're told to just kind of dominate or be that dominant person and they don't ask you anything. And so because of that, a lot of times sexual pleasure is not something top of the mind to them. Like it's not even a conversation that people and couples have within their, with their man, with their woman or anything because of the way people are raised. And Sri, you mentioned that earlier is how are you supposed to have a voice if you aren't actually comfortable with yourself? Now, if you're muted as is, then where are you even going to develop the voice in the, in the first place? And if you're already getting stressed out by everybody around you and all the expectations put on you. And on top of that, all of the shame that's around all the questions that you might have, you're not going to have the courage to be able to speak up for yourself in the first place, which goes right back to what Nail was saying is that you're easier to shut down then. So this sort of cycle continues on and onward and people just cannot move forward in that case. And there, that cycle of shame is constantly perpetuated. This also cycle of shame transitions into another topic that's really important is sexual assault and sexual violence. So what has your experience been with that kind of topic? And what have people said with this hush-hush culture around sexual assault that you've seen in your community as well? For sure. I mean, there's been a lot of work that I think we've done and tried to uncover and like, again, just creating that space for having these conversations. And I do think it really, you can see the progress and see the lineage of that in terms of exactly what Danya was talking about in terms of colonization and the ways in which are like in all of the different ways of what was once normal and that having been changed to be someone else's um, rhetoric, someone else's tune. And then the impacts of that in terms of like, oh, crap, now you're you're never going to live up to the oppressor. There's because no matter if you follow all the rules, guess what? You're the wrong freaking color. So even if you do it all right, there's going to be all of um, this fallout as you like are attempting, you're striving to, to achieve this ideal that you'll never get to. And then if you think about that in terms of like, well, of course, then it's not going to be incentivized to talk about sexual assault, to talk about interpersonal violence, because there's still this thing. And even, you know, as we talk about, for example, in the present day and within the U.S. of being a model minority, quote unquote, and within that, there's like extra. So this pressure where you're like, OK, I get all these benefits of being seen as like the goodest of the Browns, but Within that, you're still never going to be white. And so as you're trying to make it and you're like striving the hardest, any any imaginable ding seems like the end of the world, right? And so then it brings this extra pressure of just being like, you can't 
mess up in any way. And then when violence happens, when oppression happens, when there's when there is something like discrimination, when there's sexual assault, when there is all of these different things that that we know are true of the human experience, then it becomes like, oh, you can't talk about that. You can't report that. It's going to look bad. It's going to make our community look bad. We're going to like lose our status, right? So you can really see the threads of this. And I'm not going to say that like sexual assault or sexual violence is the fault of colonization because we know that in terms of, you know, this does happen across cultures. But if you think about that repression piece and how when sexuality is even less uh, commonly discussed or like more stigmatized, then the actual rates of what's going on kind of increases because people don't have healthy outlets. You were never taught to talk about sex. You were never taught to how like consensual, healthy sexual play can happen, but you're still a sexual being, right? So like, where's that going to go? And that is like, you can just really see the roots in terms of how that continues to impact us in the present day. And even even right now, as we're talking about like the, the resurgence of Me Too, most recently in thinking about within a lot of Bangladeshi communities and having like an increased ability to talk through sexual abuse and sexual assault and how that's also going to be a part of us being able to reconnect our sexual health and our mental health is to be able to air this out and talk about how we're going to intervene on community levels to change this and change the way that people operate. I was at this party right before COVID started and I was eavesdropping on a conversation with the aunties group and everything. And I heard them talking about someone who had been sexually assaulted and the conversations were just so obscene to me. They were around, oh, like, She's damaged, basically. She's not going to find someone to marry her because that happened to her. And it was such, I don't even know how people, it wasn't around, is she okay? Or what happened? Or how do we fix her as in mentally and make sure she's okay? But it was, oh, she's spoiled or she's ruined, basically. And like, this is a mistake. And so if we can't even be as a community having a conversation around something as difficult to go through as like, sexual assault, rape, sexual violence, and how are we even going to, I don't even know what to say, honestly. I was so... Well, some of the conversations I think recently have been, especially that I've seen around on social media, have been around these Desi frats, right? And how a lot of these frat brothers stand up for one another and lie in order to protect one another, even when the others are accused of sexual assault. And so there's generally no accountability here as is, as a system, there's a huge failure on accountability. And then on top of that, going back to what we were discussing actually with Raj from Pink Ledu Project is that women also are guilty of perpetuating the same cycle as well, because we are not taught better. And on top of that, we are not I don't know if it's self-actualized enough or if it's that we're not given enough power or that we don't take enough power to be able to also hold ourselves accountable and change the system. And instead, it's like the aunties that Nahal was just mentioning. Can you blame them if they've probably never been taught anything better anyway and they have not been encouraged to speak up? They've likely also been in these same situations and learned that remaining silent as a minority woman in a culture that is very patriarchal is probably the best way to go. And that's just their role, their safest way. That's the only survival tactic that they know. And therefore, they're going to continue to blame the next generation and the girls and the women in that generation for things that happen to them because they just can't imagine the fact that if you stand up, potentially we could change this. Did y'all see that one graphic on Instagram about the male misogyny of South Asians that just came out yesterday? That was a really interesting read. So um, listeners, I'll post that, repost that again. It was on our story the other day, but it kind of fits into this conversation perfectly. Um, One of the things I was just going to say is like, you know, and I think about Bollywood because that's what I'm familiar with. But this culture of, you know, we talk about like the item girls and things like that, where women are so hypersexualized, but they are literally an object, right? Because it's an item song. So it is something to gawk at. 
And like, I think there is this sense, you know, from, from, from men, it's a sense of, I want that, but I can't have it. I don't know where to get that. So I'm going to go out and rape someone, right? Like, because I don't know how else to like, like have sex. I don't know how it's done in a healthy manner. So like, I'll just do that. And, you know, and like, I'm oversimplifying it, but like, that's that repression piece, right? Of like not being able to, you know, get that object of desire. And then from women, it's like, I want to be here, but I can't be because of all these expectations. So instead, I'm going to degrade her because that's what I've been taught to do. And like, it's this like, and that's exactly what we're talking about, right? Like, men are not the only people who um, perpetuate patriarchy. It's also women. And it's not always their fault, but there is, to me, there is a speak of, especially in this day and age, obviously safety is a big thing, but like, for me, like, I can't stand not speaking up, right? Like, talking about things, like, in my family, I come from, like, a Bra- Brahmin family, right? Puja, all that stuff. They're very strict r- rules around, like, periods and stuff. And I'm just, like, I could never sit back. And I always was, like, why? Why is it that? Like, why do I have to follow this rule? Because, like, in, in my, you know, I am a scientist, right? So, like, if you can't explain the logic, then it's not going to happen, you know? And so, like, I could never not question why I was following blindly, you you know, but I know that not everyone has that privilege, but like, hopefully it'll happen more and more. And we break these like ridiculous traditions that I'm sure God did not invent. You know, they came from some man who was like, let's do this, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. And don't even get me started on periods and not oh my sitting God. things like, yeah, no, no, there's no, just, not that's today. another episode not altogether. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that we've talked about today has been sort of all over the place in the in the grand spectrum of things, you know, in terms of heteronormativity versus and in having a gender binary and things like that. But it is really interesting, too, that in South Asian culture, gender binary has not necessarily been around for this entire time and this entire history. We've kind of... And I'll say, actually, in all cultures, not just, yeah, yeah South Asians by any means, yeah. Yeah, it's very... It's not something that is this old fashioned thing that's been around for thousands and thousands of years and everybody was always just either male or female in that set. There's been a lot of different rises of communities and different ways of recognizing communities that don't necessarily fall in one or the other. And I know that Sri, you've mentioned a couple of times and and Danya, you have also uh, touched on this a little bit, but do you want to tell us a little bit about those? Because they do tie into colonialism as well. So do you want to talk about it? Do you want me to talk about it? Let's talk about it really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. I will also, um, I can share this with y'all to, to throw up in the show notes as well. But something that I use in classes that I teach and in seminars is uh, this like PBS map that I really like that talks about all sorts of non-binary gender expression throughout the entire world um, and thinking about all of the ways in which this construct of gender being uh, just like a purely masculine versus feminine thing is completely arbitrary. And I mean, obviously, gender is culturally constructed. So you have to, those intersections are critical to understanding gender, including what the norms are for any particular gender within that culture within that time within that space right and so when you actually like go into the history of this you're like oh so any sort of quote unquote third gender or blends of gender or anything that goes outside of kind of that common script of man and woman has been around for millennia like that is as old as our humanity is and really you know when you're thinking about gender as these scripts of who to be and how to be that only comes about with the advent of society and culture. And it and like so then when you just kind of break it down like that, you're like, oh, yeah, it actually does make sense that that would be a very recent construction and is not accurate to what people's experiences have been across history and across time. And so if you think about that, even within the South Asian community. So, I mean, I, I actually think Hydra is like a pretty – common term that folks have become more um, familiar with. And and with that, you can't, you have to also think about caste and how that has been a, a major part of the way within South Asian communities that third gender hydro folks have been, um, 
had oppressions layered upon them. But thinking about, for example, like Pakistan, actually, I think it was last year or 2018, um, did officially designate a third hijra um, gender marker. And so when you think about that and you're like, oh, yeah, like uh, Muslim societies are so oppressive. And then you're like, shut up. This is a Christian like new advent. You know, this is this is like a new scripture on what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to look like. And and there's and who we're supposed to have sex with. Right. Exactly. Right. And that's going to be based on who you are yourself and what genitalia you have. And like those are the parts that um, make sex what it is. But we know that it's as we talked about, it's emotional, it's spiritual. It's all of the things it's relational that are not just about what's in your pants by any means. And so thinking about that history and just like I mean, I think y'all were even as we were kind of planning the episode, we were talking about what are the different ways in which our sexuality what does it look like for like a hetero person versus a queer person versus a trans person or a, a trans person who's also queer? My answer to that is it's all the same because we are ultimately, as humans, we are one race. <laughs> Biologically, we are the same. There are not marked differences between genders. There's not marked differences between sexes. There's not marked differences between races or ethnicities. And when you bring it back to just like, we are these little spirits that happen to be in whatever specific body we happen to be in this moment in time, just kind of bumbling about trying to like feed ourselves and give ourselves water and find some community and connection. And I think that's all that any of us are trying to do. And ultimately, it's like it doesn't really matter what identity you have, what is going on on the outside, what's because really, like, I think for the most part, we're all looking for the same things and we operate in the same ways and that connection of all aspects of our health and our body and who that who that connects to with other people doesn't really matter it comes down to the same thing and in the cheesiest way it's all about the inside it's what's inside here (laughs) that is so cheesy but so true that's what i learned (laughs) But before we end today's episode, we have one final question that kind of ties in all of the conversations that we have had today is how does one's heterosexual sexuality affect their mental health versus someone from the LGBTQ community? So we've talked about this a little bit, but, you know, I've talked about how it's kind of getting intertwined, but there are separate things. So how have you seen that come about to be? Um, I think one of the biggest things, and we've we've touched on this multiple times, is that expectation of heterosexuality, right? And like, and then you bring in the intersections of being like South Asian and you know whatever part of South Asian society you come from, all your expectations that are piled on top of a person, and you know, like obviously, if if you ha- you know have a have a family or a community that's not accepting of you, it's gonna have a negative toll on your mental health, right? And for for some LGBTQ folks, right, and this is true of you know no matter what culture you're from, people will find chosen family because you your biological family, you know, which again, you know, and again, we in South Asian culture, family is supposed to be this like strong thing, right? Like anything for your family, your family will do anything for you, except when you're fucking the wrong person, right? That's when family's going to be like, oh, hey. not <laughs> my daughter, goodbye, <laughs> you know? Um, but like, you know, just as like Sri was saying, like at the end of the day, why does it matter, right? But it's, it's all the expectations we talked about. It's all the weight of the world, not only on ourselves, but on our parents and, and because it's what they have grown up with. And like, you know, I... Uh, recently watched um I can't remember what the movie was was called um but it's um it was a, a mainstream Bollywood movie that featured like a um a gay main character and it was it was pretty well done it had that was part of its plot line but there were other things going on um and I oh Shubh Mangal um oh, yes, or something yes. like that right yes Aishman Karana um, Aishman Karana and I love our Aishman Karana so I watched it with my parents and it, it was good um but you know it ended and my parents were like. And this is something I've heard from multiple people that like, you know, when we were growing up, like this didn't exist. And I was like, what didn't exist? And they were like, you know, implying that like sometimes like you know, gay gayness, people didn't exist yeah, whenever they, like, were, yeah, yeah, when they were younger. Yeah, when they were younger. I've heard that. It just, you know, it just yeah. came to and me. It just, yeah. And, you know, like, 
And one of the things I've always like told them is it's not that people didn't exist. It, they always did. It's just that for a lot of times it's so unsafe for people to express themselves that there are people that you probably know that are honestly like in the closet because and you will never know because it's unsafe for them to express that. And, you know, we know of people who are part of the LGBTQ community, but they, you know, they'll marry someone of the opposite gender because that's what's expected. They'll have children, they'll have families, right? Like because unfortunately, that's the only they, they you know, that's the only choice that's that's viable for them because no other choice is safe right like and it's what Sri was saying earlier you know when you have this sort of minority stress theory right it comes right back to the fact that as a cis het white man you are the safest in society that's just a fact of the matter and so then you maybe go down one level and you're going okay well if you're lgbtq and white you have some some issues turn into lgbtq and black and you have even more issues. And as you keep peeling back the onion and you go to the next community and the next community that's marginalized and intersectional with multiple other things and multiple other marginalized communities, then you're increasing your risk of being unsafe when you come out and you are owning up to who you are. And so it comes right back to, OK, I am more stressed out now and I am far less able to own who I am and be authentic and live a very contented life because it is not okay for me to do that, given how many different marginalized communities I'm a part of versus the entire world, which is seemingly against you. So I can imagine that, you know, when it comes down to heterosexuality and mental health versus somebody from the LGBTQIA community and their mental health, that heterosexuality in this case works in their favor in a heteronormative community. Right. They don't have quite as many stressors in some regard, in some way. Barriers and, yes, exactly. Yeah. They have far less obstacles than somebody who is South Asian, for example, and LGBTQI. Mm -hmm. I think it all comes down to that piece of sexual repression and like it it rears its head in so many different ways. And yes, you can be a woman and have the patriarchal expectations, but you can also be part of the LGBTQ community and you're facing those same patriarchal, you know, expectations, but in a different way, you know, but you both face that burden in different ways. So it's, it's like a very common thread, I think, across our community that represses people in so many different ways that they may not even realize. Have you guys seen the cartoon that came out Probably in the last week, I've seen it made it make its rounds, and it's two. It's a white man and a black woman, and they're about to race. And he goes, "What? It's the same distance," and that's like his thought bubble, and that's what it says. And she's got like a cannon strapped to her ankle, and her race course has like a hurdle full of thorned fences and bushes and obstacles in its way and it's the same length as this man's it's completely clear and it was really really eye-opening to see that because i thought oh this is such a great depiction of what these inequities look like across different marginalized populations versus white males because you're, you're looking at a path, the same path. You could be looking at exactly the same thing, but the person from the marginalized community has the cannonball strapped to their ankle and is carrying a dead weight on their back and is about to run through a fence full of thorns to try and get across to the same length in the same space. That much more debris in the way as you're trying exactly, to make it. Exactly. Yeah. That many more obstacles. So there you have it, listeners. We have learned so much about the mind and body connection, what it's like to have sexual and mental health be connected, and all these other healths that you were talking about, actually, Sri. So thank you, Sri and Tanya, for being on with us today. Make sure you follow SASMA on social media. We're going to link them on our website and also on our graphics for the week of the post, or of this podcast, I mean. And also follow The Woke Desi on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Like we always say, get woke, stay woke. This is, this the, is woke the Woke Daisy. Woke Daisy.